Uh, boa tarde a todos, obrigadíssimo por estarem aqui na nossa, no nosso segundo webinar do Take Off Algarve. A nossa, uh, a nossa sessão vai ser conduzida em inglês, os nossos convidados são, são de fora, temos um convidado de Inglaterra, um convidado da Bélgica, um convidado da Holanda e um convidado do Brasil que ainda não temos a certeza que consiga entrar devido a situações que estão neste momento a acontecer e que estão a alterar a agenda do, do nosso convidado, mas ele está a fazer um esforço para, para entrar. Portanto, a todos, obrigado por cá estarem. Eu vou agora fazer uma apresentação já em inglês, não só do que é que é o take-off, mas também do que é que se espera desta, desta sessão. E, portanto, a sessão também vai ser gravada para disseminação. Um, o que nós pedimos é que durante as apresentações, isto é informal, mas há, há, há um momento onde pedimos a cada convidado que partilhe as suas ideias, que estejamos todos com o microfone desligado e à medida que vocês vão tendo questões, que, assuntos que gostassem de ser, que vissem debatidos, pedíamos que escrevessem no, no bate-papo ou na, no, no, no chat que, que tem cá embaixo no vosso menu, e à medida do possível nós vamos pedindo aos convidados que vão respondendo ou que vão uh, refletindo sobre os vossos tópicos, está bem? Portanto, vou passar a, a, para inglês. Uh, esta sessão está a ser facilitada por mim, Américo Mateus, que sou um, o, direto, o coordenador do, do iChip do ISMAT, que já vou explicar melhor o que é. Está também o professor do ISMAT, o professor Gabriel Patrocínio. E também está a professora Susana Leonor, estamos todos a facilitar e a também partilhar um bocadinho das nossas ideias com os convidados. Portanto, com a vossa permissão vou passar para inglês. Ok, so uh, I had to make this Portuguese statement in order for everybody to understand why the session will be in English. It's quite logical, but uh, we need to do these things. Ok, so first of all, I want to thank to our guests to have accepted our invitation to be part of our webinar. I have to uh, also uh, give my thanks to my colleagues, uh, Professor Gabriel Patrocinio and uh, Professor Susana Leonor, that uh, organized the session with us and made the invitation for our guests to, to be here. So, um, the purpose of, uh, of this webinar Uh, it's to, to, to talk about and to listen to some uh, experience from people from different places about uh, startups, incubators, uh, centers for entrepreneurship and innovation, um, anything that can help us uh, uh, on the purpose of creating new business, uh, rethinking what could be the best uh, uh, business development that we can have for our uh, entrepreneurs, not only the ones that will be and are and will be connected with the ISHIP from ISBAT, that is the new incubation center from our university, but nowadays we are more focused on understanding what is changing, what COVID and what this pandemic and this crisis can also change uh, in our, uh, on the settings of innovation and entrepreneurship in the world, and how can we network Uh, even better or in better conditions in order to allow us to have uh, more replies and more tools and more methods to help entrepreneurs to, entrepreneurs to succeed in difficult times as, as this one. So because we're having an economical crisis and entrepreneurship is, all, is an answer, but it's also part of the, of the ecosystem. So if the ecosystem is not good, entrepreneurship is also part of the, you have to rethink what, what to do. So I will just start and have uh, five minutes of the floor just to present you what is the takeoff uh, uh, conferences and what is iShip in a very, very short uh, presentation, just to make a small framework of, of, of our topic today. So hoping that you, I can, you are looking at, uh, I, I'm sharing in the right way, right? You are looking at the presentation, yes? Okay. So that's uh, iShip, it's, uh, it's our new adventure in our university. It's a research, innovation and entrepreneurship center. So we put together the area of research, fundamental and applied research, and we put it together with an area of developing uh, uh, entrepreneur and innovation through a startup incubation center, but also operating with a community. So uh, it's two in one, <laughs> let's say. Um, in order to develop the, 
the, the, the our department, our organic unit. Um, we call it iShip. It's a mixture of innovation and ideas with entrepreneurship. And also because we are located in the Algarve region. We are located in Portimão. Portimão means a bit of harbor. It has to do with the word harbor. And we are a, a sailing city. So that's why we call it iShip, because uh, uh, it's, it's to remind a little bit of, of the sea. It's not that we are only incubating for ideas in, in regarding maritime economy. It's just uh, to remind us that as an, as an harbor, we don't want to be a, 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 a rival harbor. We want to be a department of harbor that will enable our students and our uh, community to have a more entrepreneurial future. Uh, that's what I was uh, telling you about the three areas. We, got, we made some kind of research also about the, our experience and we see iShip to, can, that can operate in these three areas because uh, we have lots of inspirations that we join together. So we will have an academic focus. That's why we are supporting our university uh, effort to become an entrepreneurial uh, university. And in this sense, we will be operating focus on building the persona. And we have inspirations from, from uh, projects from Tom Fleakers, that is one of our guests, also from friends of us in Austria, also from the Brazilian uh, that uh, uh, may not be with us, but it was supposed to be with us, Luis Salmão. So we have an inspirational so that we can understand what is this academic focus where we want to help students to build the persona of entrepreneur. Then we have the projects that inspire us and the people that inspire us regarding the incubation focus of our, of our uh, unit and also the, the community focus. So if we're going from building the persona to building the business idea, idea so also important to build the network. And to build the network, we have examples from different parts of the world, even Portugal, about how to involve the community in this uh, uh, entrepreneurial journey. Um, in, in, a, in, in very short, this is what we developed for our, for, our, for our center. So we developed the academic area where we can do the fundamental research that can support all of this project and the activities within our university that can build the entrepreneur. Training programs, mentoring and coaching, etc. And we also build it uh, uh, the normal startup uh, stages uh, or entrepreneurial uh, stages of seeds, uh, early stage and acceleration and grow. And we also saw what would be the best examples to involve the community in the, our center. So we created uh, uh, ideas up, an open door to all the entrepreneurs and the existing uh, business people who also can come and be part of our uh, uh, iShip ecosystem. The very small idea here that is, uh, I think, even more important in the days we live today of, of, of COVID crisis is this innovation focus that we have on the, on the right side. Um, it's about, we think it's very, it's, it would be very, we think it's very useful that we don't put our incubation center only, only working for people with the first time ideas. We are looking for giving a second chance to old entrepreneurs and old is not age. So we want that people that today are facing problems in their business, their business model doesn't make sense anymore. The things that change in the last weeks, they, are, they don't know what to do, come to the center, come to our, uh, come and uh, with us, with young blood, with our mentors, our coaches and our professional, partners from investment capital, for example, we will try to help this business also. So for us, entrepreneurship, uh, a startup center is not only for first time entrepreneurs, it's also for people that need a second chance, a, re, a, re, a, a new route for navigation in these difficult times. And that's a bit what we think is a bit different in our project of iShip uh, and we did it before of the crisis. Now, I think it even makes more sense to have also this oriented uh, focus on these people that need uh, to go back and develop the idea again. Um, 
So for, for, for putting ourselves in the market to launch ourselves, but more important to make our job of helping the region and impacting the region visible, we created this webinar series. This is the second in 17. And this is in Portuguese, it means rethink and redesign the region to make everybody together participating from different sciences, from these different knowledge areas, from different experience to help us put the ship back on the, on the sea again, but in, uh, with different tools and dif different navigating sets. Um, so our webinars need, uh, aim to promote the debate to, to make ignition of economic areas that can be complementary to tourism. One of the problems in the Algarve is everything is about tourism and we need to, to make it different. We need to make it more different anchors of economy. And we need to do it thinking on sustainable and a lifelong journey. It's not only to the next uh, month or the next year. Uh, we need to think about new trends and new future, future scenarios. And we need to think about what is this new normal that we are going, uh, that we are facing. Everybody talks a new normal, but nobody explains what is the new normal. And as we said, to also see how to, can we help on uh, putting back on track these this small and micro-sized businesses that nowadays face a big problem with the tourism uh, crisis that is going to emerge, that is emerging already with the pandemia. And finally, to also promote a more economic, creative economic driven uh, um, region. That uh, creative economy in the Algarve is not strong and I think is one of the ways to, to make a different uh, future for our young entrepreneurs and our uh, uh, entrepreneurs in general. So this is uh, not for reading <laughs> because this is the 17 uh, webinars. One is missing in my account there. So it's 17 webinars. It's uh, 30 teachers from our university from eight different fields of knowledge. And we have 25 uh, international experts from nine different countries. So the idea is to talk about design, entrepreneurship, architecture, psychology, law, business, human resources, is everybody talking, uh, how can we together think how to uh, uh, help the region to develop uh, future innovation uh, and face the problems that emerge with this crisis. But one of the more important things is not to, to go to the business as usual again, because it was not okay previous to the COVID-19. So, um, um, I will just take one minute to explain what I mean here. It's very important. Before of the COVID-19, we were in meetings and operators of tourism already said to us, we are making such a low margin in our profits that we are almost losing money. So in order to be competitive, to have mass people coming to the Algarve, the business value diminished. It is very short. And so we were already having problems. People, uh, the developers and responsibles were already telling us we need help to rethink and to make some innovation on our product because our product is diminishing value very high. Of course, we have lots of people coming here, but in the end, the value that is left is smaller. So that's what we heard before of the crisis from uh, CEOs of, of resorts and CEOs of different uh, uh, businesses in the Algarve that make us think we need an innovation project for the Algarve, also for tourism. Okay, in very short, that's why um, creating this iShip, we are transdisciplinary and we created a research approach to this. And I'm going to just not taking too much time, but going to one slide to explain what we are doing. So we have a concrete way of operation. We have a four stage in research project on the different areas that we are implementing in the Algarve so that we can take some conclusion and help the region. And uh, the most important information is all of our researchers and research is centered on thinking and knowing what is people, what is changing on people 
on the on, on what is changing on people that uh, want to develop business and want what is changing on people that want to come and develop our region or visit our region what is changing so that we can change processes and we can change products and in order to do that and this is the important slide we are already developing these different research lines so we have a research line that is uh, looking for what is changing in values and beliefs of people in cognition and in behavior that we need to understand in order to have some insights for the innovation we are looking what is changing in technology how can we integrate better and smarter technology we are looking and researching in the different uh, line of research what is the new future what are the future scenarios what are the new spaces what are the new industries that we can incorporate also regarding a different project <laughs> regarding the innovation cultures what is changing like simon will talk to you very very good about mindsets what is changing and what needs to be changed in order for things to to be different and what can change in leadership and what can change in business business models and services so what we're saying is it's not one research project it's different research problem projects that will combine in one analysis and this combination will come up with some actions that we can help the region and our entrepreneurs to develop businesses towards a more innovative tourism algarve offer um, and we will conclude this research by implementing a living lab to test and validate the outcomes that we are going to uh, give to the region as an impact so <clears throat> I'm sorry for taking these uh, moments to make the uh, presentation, but hello, Nick. Uh, see you already there. <laughs> uh, but the, the idea, this is just a frame in very short. So I ship, it's the area of our university that takes care of research, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, um, and that takes focus on impacting the region with innovative proposals to develop a better and a more touristic and a more economical, uh, creative economical vision for facing the future. And uh, today, our aim is to talk about entrepreneurship and what is changing and what examples and what can we give to our uh, entrepreneurs that is young entrepreneurs, first time entrepreneurs and second chance entrepreneurs that need to re re rearrange their business and their ideas and their operations how can we help them on these moments of of, of this crisis and the moments that we are facing in the next years how can we help them to make more focused approaches so that their business can impact can have results for the region for the people of the region and for them as entrepreneurs so that is the mode let's say for our for our uh, webinar today i don't know if uh, uh, anybody uh, especially from our guests want to make some question that can be important for your presentation if not we will start by listening the first round of ideas and sharing from our guests and then we will uh, as i said in the beginning we will start debating and, and looking at the questions and the, the arguments and the reflections that the participants are making or will make in our in a, in the in the talking area uh, of the Zoom, uh, so that we can have lots of interactions. The session is not for Americo, is not for Gabriel, is not for Tom, is not for Simon, is not for Nick. It's for all of us. It's for networking, but especially for for the guests, students, and people that are not students that are with us in this session. So. When you have a question, write it down so that we can put the, the, the talk towards your needs. Okay, you understand? Okay, so um, uh, as, as, as accorded previously, I will ask Tom, Tom Fleakers, uh, to uh, start sharing um, their visions and their exper in the, in the experiences. Tom is the course coordinator of management and entrepreneurship in Karel de Groot University in Belgium, in Antwerp. Um, lots of things are running in Karel de Groot regarding entrepreneurship. That's, they, they are an inspiration for us as I wrote it in the project. Uh, startup campus, the way they 
put the students to think about how to become entrepreneurs since the first day in the school almost. They have also the example of the takeoff Antwerp, which I stolen, <laughs> adapted for the takeoff take of Algarve naming. And that is uh, how Antwerp is helping and developing entrepreneurship in the city. And so uh, thank you, Tom, for accepting this uh, invitation. And we, uh, I think now it's time to listen to you and any questions, we also be here to, to help. So first of all, thanks and let's, uh, have uh, your ideas on these topics. Thank you, Americo. Thank you for the invitation to be a part of this uh, seminar, webinar on entrepreneurship. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, so my name is Tom Flerikers. I'm from Antwerp, Belgium. Nick, I presume we're just a few kilometers away from each other because I'm just north of Antwerp. <clears throat> so nice seeing somebody else from the, the northern countries as well uh, present in, uh, in this webinar. Um, being at Carol de Grote, being a course creator program manager for uh, small medium enterprise management and international entrepreneurship. Um, let's say um, entrepreneurship is part of my, my, of the genes of my two programs. And let me just um, take you down a, a trip down memory lane maybe to explain how we look at entrepreneurship and how it evolved over time at KDG, because Carol de Grote is quite a long name, we also say KDG as an abbreviation of Carol de Grote. Um, when, I think it was seven, eight years ago, we had students um, in our classes starting to bother my uh, lecturers on, um, sir, can I ask you a question? <clears throat> um, I have an idea, uh, I, I want to start a business. And at that time, um, lecturers didn't really know how to respond to that because it was quite new. We were at the mindset of being those brave Belgian uh, people who were not so entrepreneurial, but just really, really hard workers. <clears throat> and we were in, in some sort of philosophy. You, you do the study first, and then you're being entrepreneurial. And seven, eight years ago, we noticed that students being aged 18, 19 years old um, started popping up in classes um, wanting to be entrepreneurial. They had ideas. And instead of I'm saying to them, well, finish your education first and then think about being entrepreneurial. We, um, well, we sat together with, with a few colleagues, uh, one amongst them was Peter Spangers, who was also uh, being an academical influence uh, in the program of ICIP I've learned uh, from the Slash Medical. Um, and I said, okay, how can we work with this? How can we deal with these students who want to be entrepreneurs? And then we talked, okay, let, we, we should give them chances, we give them an opportunity to already start developing their own business during their um, programs. So we came up with the idea of why not graduate with your own company? Instead of finishing um, your, your uh, studies first and then thinking about your own company, why not finish with your, uh, with your own company? And that's how I started with Campus. Um, well, was founded uh, first uh, as a competition. <clears throat> and I remember the first time we had, I think, 20 students who applied to be part of the competition of startup at campus who want to start their own business um, at university, at our university. And um, the second and third year, we grow to 40, 50 students who want to be entrepreneurial. And then we noticed we had to disappoint a few of them because we could not guide them. We only had room, space, time for two, three, four students to, to be um, guided for the next year to, to really get them to start up. So a, a lot of students were disappointed. And I remember that, that time, I think it was the third year, I, I, um, I looked at the students' eyes and they were like, um, so we cannot go on to the, on to the, the second round then to, to start our business. And we said, no, sorry, you, you can't. We just don't have capacity to do that. Although the ideas are really, not all of them, but um, most of them are really valuable and really okay to start working on. So it's okay, we need, to, we need to think about it. How can we work with this as a university? And that's how um, in Antwerp, KDG, where, where it's located, uh, we started the, the first entrepreneurship center at, at our campus, our student entrepreneurship center at our campus where we have Anami. Um, and Anami is, our, um, is, is the mother for all entrepreneurial students. And, and, and I think she's really important. Um, and, and you wanna have one um, key success factor, Americo, for your eyeship. I think you, you should have a, a mother or a father there for each entrepreneurial student. Cry on somebody who can, who can tap them on the back. 
And that's really important for those entrepreneurs because they're 18, 90, 20 years old. And we've, we've really learned that they, they need some sort of safe haven or safe harbor as, as being a, a port city there um, to turn to. And that's why we, we, we opened up the entrepreneurs students now. And we have, um, for the last five years, have over 100 student entrepreneurs each year who are enrolled in our Startup Entrepreneurship Center, who are supported in becoming an entrepreneur. And it starts with being um, a pre-entrepreneur, being we have an idea. We help them to develop the idea, but also into going to market strategies, also um, going to banks, also sure that they get a loan there. Um, but always with the same philosophy. It's your responsibility not ours and i think that's really important when we talk about entrepreneurship that it's 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 they are the entrepreneurs not we they are so we should give full responsibility to the students to the student entrepreneurs and also give them all the credit and that that's for a lot of students a, a big um step into the into the unknown as i've learned that a lot of students think it's um think it's really awkward to to start being the entrepreneur, they have an idea, and then we challenge them to take it one step further, and again, and again, and again, and they get um, little mommy and me who helps them, supports them, taps them on the back. But then you get that that one point of no return, where you need to, well, take out take out the, the formulas and take out the the, the papers and, and and start applying for formal business. And and we notice that that time they they. They really are challenged to do that. And then they look at us and they say, why can't you do that for us? And no, you are the entrepreneur, not we. So, and that's, I think is really important. And, and over, um, since 2014, so already five years, six years, we were the first in Antwerp to do this. But as you may or may not know, in Antwerp, we have, we are not the only university college there. We got our colleagues from, from AP University College, but also University of Antwerp and the city of Antwerp. And at that time, 2014, we got a new mayor, and Bart de Weber, the mayor of Antwerp, is really fond of uh, making, of turning Antwerp into the startup capital of Belgium. So he brought together um, the city, all higher education institutions, so being the University of Antwerp, KTG, and AP, um, together on the table, together with the city, and also the, um, Oh, how do I need to call in English? We say Hogere Zeevaartschool, but the higher education for to, to become a, a, a someone who can do a vessel or something. So that kind of stuff. Um, so we were put together at the table and that's the way uh, Take of Antwerp um, was founded because we needed also an ecosystem in the city who could support our students. So we, we had the vision of, of being the Entrepreneurial University in Antwerp, being KDG Center for Entrepreneurship, close to our students, but that's not enough. You need to have an ecosystem installed in your area, city or area, where you can combine your forces. You don't need to do things double. We, and, and I think the cool thing about Takeoff is it's really an alliance there of the city, the, the, the universities, uh, the, the higher education institutions, and also Chamber of Commerce. So together we build an ecosystem where we have um, seminars, where we have support, where we have um, events, a kickoff event, a big kickoff event each year. We have a closing event. Uh, we do uh, specific workshops for specific um, target groups, like for instance, doctors. Is, is it, they're also entrepreneurs. So we do specific um, workshops regarding for, for doctors. We do them except for accountants. We do them for nurses. We do them to make sure that all those people are, are specifically serviced with their needs. And that's cool because as, as KDG, we cannot do that by ourselves. That's just too wide open. So we discussed that we will build an ecosystem in the city of Antwerp, where we would um, make sure that we have a, a strong structure there. Um, communication on entrepreneurship is, is done there. We also, do, we also apply for grants and funds. But the the mentoring for the students is done within the institutions. So we try to remain close to the student to be their safe harbor because my students from KDG, they will not go to take off Antwerp, which is a separate location. They will not go to the University of Antwerp by themselves to look for support. They will go to Anami. 
the little mommy, well, not so little, but the mommy there who is there for them. And I think that's really, you do entrepreneurship is that you, you, you empower students to be entrepreneurial, you support them, but you also make them responsible for being entrepreneurs. And then if possible, you try to make an ecosystem on top of that where you combine forces with different kind of um, um, stakeholders who, who can help each other out. And, that, and, and I think that's the cool thing was mainly, especially with, with AP, the other uh, university college, we are competitors, but not when it's an entrepreneurship. We work together, we join forces, and we are not eager towards each other. We are um, almost caring for each other and loving each other, helping each other out to make sure that we support all those student entrepreneurs in Antwerp. And I think that's really um, awesome there. So rounding things up, I think, for the, for the Antwerp case, not want to take it too long to make sure that we have enough time for Q&A, um, is to make sure that, that um, empower the students, which I think is really important. Um, give them room, give them space. Also within the curricula, I did not maybe mention that uh, before, but also give them room in the curricula to be entrepreneurial. Um, my students can, in both of my programs, 30 of 180 ECTS, so uh, one sixth of ECTS can be done within their own business. So they earn credits within their own business. That's of course a huge motivator for them to start being entrepreneurial. Um, so looking to the future, Americo, I, I think we should look into how can we collaborate and that, that's something I'm, I'm looking forward to do so with all people in the room uh, who I may or may not know. Um, what I think is a challenge for entrepreneurship is to try to make it international. And together with FHV in the Vorarlberg in Austria, we are looking into how can we combine our entrepreneurs? Because student entrepreneurs are um, mainly lonely people, afraid to share their um, knowledge experience because they, they don't want to be copied. They're thinking, oh my God, someone's gonna take my idea away, he's gonna make money out of my idea. Um, well, I always say, well, your idea, I, I, when you, somebody else can think about it. But what I think could be really interesting is to combine students, to have students from Antwerp colliding with students from the Algarve in Portugal or from students with Austria, and then have them working on their own cases, but as a critical friend towards each other. The one entrepreneur to another entrepreneur, helping them out and not seeing them as competitors, but seeing, helping them out on the same level. They're, they're both entrepreneurs. And I think that's, for me, a way to go for the future. Maybe not within the next two weeks, uh, but maybe the next year or next two years, we can, make, uh, we can make this happen. And I think that's really important to look into that. And the cool thing about COVID is we now notice, well, we now know that it can also be done virtually. Um, we don't need to travel. Although I'd love to be in the Algarve for now. Um, we had, an, uh, it was nine degrees. I was looking forward to being in the Algarve in June, America, as we, as we discussed to be the, at the formal conference. Um, so I, I still hope we can, can do a formal conference where I can be present in the Algarve, just for the temperature and the sun. But on the other hand side, we don't need to bring them physically together to be able to collaborate and to be inspired, to inspire each other. So that's why I think it's important that we start to explore these new ways of, of, of working together. And, and we've been talking for this one, I think for 15 years on how we can work together virtually. Well, now it's happening and we should make it happening also for entrepreneurs, I think. And I can talk for hours about entrepreneurship, but maybe we should keep it on, on, on this level and make, um, pass the word to, to the other people who are present in the room. Um, and looking forward to questions. I do want to apologize. I'm sorry, Michael, I told you before, I do want to apologize. I will not be able to attend until the final moment of the seminar because I have uh, another meeting waiting for me at uh, just past eight o'clock. So my apologies if I'm, I'm slipping away, but thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to questions and debate later on. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, very, very clear and uh, very focused on issues that are very important for us, uh, for the, the, the goals of our webinar. Um, before I, I pass, I just want to, to, to uh, on top of your final ideas about internationalization, I think if we cross that with the COVID, as you were doing, 
The question nowadays is that maybe an entrepreneur in the Algarve or an entrepreneur in uh, uh, Antwerp or in Dornbien, he can find something that is successful and that needs to be shared, that should be shared with entrepreneurs in the Algarve or in uh, Antwerp or in Dornbien, even for the purpose of supporting, of, of uh, helping or empowering solutions in difficult times. If it's a, a social idea, if it, whatever uh, an entrepreneur comes out uh, today, nowadays, and in the next future, and in, in the near future, uh, I mean, the sharing is also a goal of helping everybody to overcome difficulties. So that is one of the points um, that I think are very important in the mindset of the entrepreneurs nowadays is not only be afraid of not sharing the idea for nobody to steal, but your idea may be useful for saving economies, for saving some lives, so share it. Uh, you, you, you need to share it. It's a different, <laughs> it's a completely different mindset. So thank you very much, uh, Tom. We will, um, we will also ask people about uh, questions for Tom specifically, because after Simon, maybe we can ask because of your time schedule, we can ask something to, to Tom. I would now give the floor first to Gabriel, to our, my colleague, and I would love to get Gabriel presents uh, Simon um, uh, because it's knowledge of, of Gabriel and is the best person to present Simon. Okay, Gabriel? Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, well, I know this guy for how many? 12 years now, Simon? Yes, I think so. Uh, we, we, we met in, in Brazil in 2008, I believe, and he invited me to do my PhD uh, in the UK uh, with him as my supervisor. So I have the honor to introduce my supervisor, uh, my PhD supervisor here. And uh, Simon is someone who has been involved with uh, you know, an entrepreneurship uh, for more years than I know him. <laughs> So uh, when I knew him, he was constantly traveling uh, to Asia and to, well, all around the world, uh, teaching and, and uh, doing workshops and, and helping companies to develop innovation. So uh, it was a, a pleasure to have the opportunity to invite him to uh, be here today with us, discussing uh these ideas for the the, the new normal because uh, now people are questioning when they will be able to return to their activities and they perhaps they don't realize that they want uh, there's there's no going back we have to we, we only have a head um, so it's about moving forward and going ahead um, we, we know that we have a very different future ahead, uh, to say the least. Um, we are lucky because we are designers, and designers uh, project. Designers have a, a projective activity projected towards future, and so that's what we do as a profession. So we are really lucky in this uh, situation to have this mindset of moving to, to move forward. So I will pass the, the, the word to, to Simon for him to do his uh, presentation and then uh, go over, uh, go, up, go ahead with this debate. Okay, thanks a lot, Simon, for being here. Thank you, Gabriel, I mean, for uh, inviting me. I'm gonna talk about uh, two or three th themes is the, the back my background trained as a product designer um, at the Winston Royal College of Art, traveled the world and, and transitioned from being pure design into um, helping organizations, people and projects to um, be, become more effective. So I'm going to share with you three themes, a um, little bit about innovation trajectory. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, entrepreneurial mindset and how important that is. And then I'm going to give you some insight on the new normal. Um, 
currently, uh, one of the things I deal with, we run a center uh, for growth, productivity and growth. So what I'm going to share with you, we deal with over 100 companies a year. We deal regionally, we deal nationally, and we deal with students. So we, we see a lot of um, factors, both at a local level, a national level, and an international level. So first, let me talk about innovation. Is the um, please use your language correctly. Is this confusion between being innovative and being an innovator, an innovation? The, and this is the confusion we see with designers, is that innovation is about bringing something to market making something happen and there's a lot of confusion in language between being innovative which embodies creativity so first i think there's a whole issue um, out there about this language and there's a methodological battle in um, entrepreneurship startup uh, or i've traveled all over the world and what i see is this battle between ideas and insights and Ideas are the, um, and this sounds counterproductive, is that um, what we're looking for is individuals and organizations have a clear insight. Insights give, uh, connect you to a, a need, a demand, and a, 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 a pa potential pathway for multiple opportunities. What I see is that when, when you have an idea-driven approach, is the fact that if that idea isn't sustainable, is that there's, there's nothing to, to rely on. So my, my, where I see the success, the very successful incubation organizations are, are driven by effective insight, which then generate ideas, rather than coming with a, a solution that you then polish. So that, I, I'd see there's a, there's, a, there's a massive ongoing debate, and the vast majority of these incubator centers are idea-driven. The successful ones I've seen are insight driven. So that gives you a context. I just want to talk about uh, entrepreneurship and being entrepreneurial. Is they're very different. Is the, um, the in research at the moment about entrepreneurialism is that the, there's this debate. Is the assumption is that being a nascent entrepreneur is that you recognise you're being an entrepreneur. And I think there's a whole issue about latent entrepreneurialism, where people are passionate about a situation, a scenario, and then turn an opportunity or an insight into an entrepreneurial opportunity. So I think that what I'm encouraging is that I'm going to talk about two themes now. Failure is good. And I'm going to talk about success does not last forever. Effective entrepreneur is the fact that you have to be prepared to fail. And I think the previous speaker talked about this, about taking ownership, is that failure is good. The problem is if you fail on the same issue repeatedly. Failure is an opportunity to learn and to develop. And every day as an entrepreneur, if you're not failing, you're not becoming effective. Because, and what I mean by that is that if, you're, if your mindset is restricted by failure, you don't try new things, you're not open. And what you're looking for then is that um, it, 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 it predicates a me too solution. It might be a, a more beautiful me too solution, but it doesn't encourage people to take risk and take challenge. So that, and anybody who's run a business, who's become an entrepreneur, they never succeed the first time. And the great thing about entrepreneurs is like I have a picture of a person falling off a mountain bike. If you don't want to be an entrepreneur, don't get on the bike. Because if you, if to be successful, you need to be prepared to fall off the bike. So what I'm trying to say is in the mindset is that when I talk to individual organizations, I have a model called constructive failure. And and they feel that the, initially it's, ca it's counterintuitive. So when I do a workshop, I say, look, guys, what I want you to do, I want you to fail. And they look at me as though I'm crazy. But what we do is that we change their mindset where they're prepared to be more open, exploratory, and take chances. So that's my first theme. 
that failure is fundamentally a part of innovation and entrepreneurship. I'm going to throw in a little bit of a curveball here, is, is that a, a lot of the theory and a lot of the discussion implies that success is sustainable. Ideas have um, a, a, don't need to last forever. Success could be three weeks, it could be a month, it could be 12, it could be three years. What I'm saying is the ideas you have, the entrepreneurial ideas, um, the success doesn't need to last forever. It's a learning opportunity where you, you deliver something, it achieves a goal, and what you learn from that manifests itself into new thinking, new approaches, and new confidence. And, and I, I, it picks on probably a subset of this, of creative confidence. You don't build creative confidence by not failing and by trying to sustain long-term success. So there's, I hope there's two themes that you can embed into your center. Failure and that success doesn't last, have to last forever. What I want to then um, come to is these with innovation models. Um, I'm the chair professor of our innovation for innovation and my inaugural talk for my professorship was, does it actually exist? I'm not sure, but that's a debate for another. <laughs> innovation has become a metaphor for growth. And so what we're talking about here is that it's important that there are multiple, there are very, there, there are lots of models, but they all, they may have different terminology, but there's predominantly only four or five phases. So don't get hung up on the innovation model. What's important is, is this innovation mindset, entrepreneurial aspect. Um, fundamentally, if there is no demand for your idea, you do not have a business. So going back to my first theme is that it's like love. You have to be prepared to be rejected. <laughs> and you have to find out if there's a demand for your idea and learn to be rejected. People said to me, Simon, how have you become successful? I said, I've dealt with failure quickly. So the situation is that um, please do not have an incubation center that polishes and protects. And I think our first speech has sort of alluded to this. You have to open the doors and get them out there. Because if there's no demand and people don't like what you do, find out early and you can change. Where if, you, if you're afraid to fail, it's catastrophic. And what happens is that um, you, you, you only speak to people who give you the views that you want and you don't get that critical input. And innovation and entrepreneurship is about managing failure. So the fundamental, is there a demand for that? What I'll share with you is that, um, and Gabrielle will um, probably articulate this better in Portuguese, what I help people to do is ask the right question. Most businesses fail, not because they can't develop or produce something. They fail because they ask the wrong questions. And one of them is, is there a demand? <laughs> and I can give you a whole talk about that. So just let me just re rebuild that in, into the metaphor of the ship. Is the if you're only going to um, sail on journeys you know where you're going, it's going to be a very, very crowded harbour. This failure builds that whole confidence to explore, get lost, but navigate yourself back to a fixed point and try again. So before I go on to my final theme, there are three things I've, I've talked about. Failure, success, and um, um, building a, um, this notion of demand. Another theme that wanted to be discussed was network building. Play, um, I, I, only get, develop networks if it builds effective relationships. Have a reason why you're going into the network. 
I, I, I see, um, I, I'm not a great fan of the, the, the International Breakfast Club because you, you finish it with the same debates. So it's important to have networks to do things because you can share fa failures, share successes, and understand where you can add value. So networking is really important, but it's got to be about relationship building. My final concluding point is the new normal. So all that I've just told you, some of it still is relevant. We're in a very, very different, we're not about the future. What's interesting about what we're talking, I'm going to talk about three types of innovation strategies that are, 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 are fundamental at the moment that we're dealing with organizations. There's the reactive um, innovation, the stabilizing innovation, and there's refocusing innovation. Currently, it's the individual societies, it's the fact that it's not about future, it's about now. And the, the understanding of reactive innovation is really important. And, and this is why I was saying about success doesn't have to last forever. Is that there are certain challenges now that need to be addressed here and now that are either one week, three weeks, a month and so forth. So reactive um, innovation is actually really, really positive at the moment. The second thing is there's a, there's a, there's a there's a new concept of stabilizing innovation. And that can be to do with industries, um, cultures, communities, is that we're in a very turbulent time. So there's a whole opportunity for innovation opportunities that help to stabilize. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing is about refocusing innovation. And the reality is, is that, um, I've changed my concept and don't take this the wrong way because I do like Portugal. <laughs> I don't really want to come to Portugal today. <laughs> but what this has shown is that we can share ideas and connect in Portugal, which wouldn't have been a normal mentality six months ago. Okay. So this is a refocusing strategy. It was the fact that how, and this is an example of, of what I would say reactive moving from reactive into refocusing. So we have a situation here where a year ago, the norm would be we all get on a plane and we waste six days for an hour's talk. Today, we've been able to mobilize different global thoughts, connect, and in two hours time, we'll be doing something else, positive. So what I want to stress is that the new normal is there will be a future, but it's going to be made up of reactive, stabilizing and refocusing innovation over the next, uh, I'd say, 12 to 18 months. My final thing for any, um, any organization, any individual, there's one fundamental thing that drives success have a plan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Very, very, very clear, very sharp, uh, very uh, as, as a complementary to, to, to the terms. Um, I think we have lots of, lots of very good issues to, to think about here, uh, uh, very, especially the, the, um, the, the mindsets, uh, and this final part that is a, a, a confess, it's, a, it's also a new to me, these three terms, but they made lo makes a lot of sense. Reactive, establishing, and refocusing. I think that's, that's a great food for thought. <laughs> uh, it's it's a very, very focused uh, on, on what can we do for the no, new normal and still work on innovation and entrepreneurship as our field of uh, action. And, and passion as we all ha have to be to be here so uh, thank you thank you very much I, I, I say there's uh, already some some questions uh, on the on the on the talking chat in the in zoom I ask uh, other people to also start putting some of your questions I ask now uh, Tom do you still have uh, 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 more moments so that we can listen to Nick 10 minutes to, to make it fair to everybody to have questions? Yeah, okay. sure. I, I, I got to 15 past eight, so that's fine. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Tom. So, Nick, uh, 
I will uh, very fast introduce Nick uh, Van Breda. It's very difficult to, to introduce uh, Nick. I think he's a globetrotter, uh, he's a doer. He, he does everything he says he, he, he does. Uh, he's a dreamer, but he's a, a dreamer that implements and that uh, goes, uh, follows the dreams. Sometimes dream is not very well connected because it's, it, it some can be utopic. But every time I, th I, I listen to Nick to talk to something, oh, I'm going to China to here and there to do this. And I, I think to myself at first, what the hell is he doing? But then he goes, he just goes and that's, that's the point. So you understand the, my, my, ang my English is, uh, it's not that I don't, I don't doubt what you are doing. I, how can you do it? But you find ways of doing everything. So uh, my, my thought on bringing uh, Nick to this, uh, to, this, uh, to this talk is because uh, he's, a, he's a very bright young guy. Um, and is like I say, is a doer. I think he has lots of experience to share with our uh, audience, our participants, because uh, there's no limits for, for Nick. So the first time I met Nick, it was on a co-creation conference. He was still student and he talked about co-creation with a passion and with the, he said he is going to change the world and he's doing it. So <laughs> I think it's the best, the best way to, to tell that, to, to, to introduce uh, uh, Nick is that he thinks he can change the world and he's doing. And I, I, I thank you very much also, Nick, to come here. This, the, store, this, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm sure you will share uh, some of your initiatives and things that you have been participating. Um, and if you feel that in my introduction, something is missing, please, it's so much to talk that <laughs> just uh, stress what, whatever I, I didn't just stress right now. So thank you, Nick, the floor is yours, man. Sure, thank you. And uh, I will start uh, by sharing my presentation because um, talking about stuff is quite hard when you're using a lot of exponential technologies and, uh, and a lot of exponential transformations. So um, let me know if you can see it by uh, putting up a thumb in the comments. <laughs> and um, let's start. So um, I was asked uh, like a few days ago by America uh, <laughs> to prepare a presentation. So I did my best to uh, work on uh, some things that are that are, might be interesting for the region of Algarv and uh, most of all about rethinking and re redesigning Algarve itself uh, from an entrepreneurial perspective. So looking at different sides, one, the one side is about uh, looking at um, exponential technologies and like you can see over here where we are using VR to give people a, a holiday experience um, also on the sustainability uh, we organized in, uh, in Utrecht in a city in the Netherlands where uh, this was in the city center people were transferred to their favorite holiday place uh, using VR putting their feet in the sand I think we are, you are, uh, we are not seeing your next slides. We just with the beach in the, we are still seeing the beach in the Algarve. I think that's the first one. So it's very mm -hmm. simple. You have to share the screen, but uh, yeah, yeah, share your screen and not the, yeah. Um, it, you, it, it's like this, Nick. It happened to me yesterday also. It's you share the screen, yeah. but you have to share your screen and not the presentation because when you put the full screen, we don't see it anymore, okay? I noticed, I noticed. So I showed, uh, I showed only the first screen. So now you can see the second, right? So this is, uh, this is how we transferred uh, people on the holiday using uh, VR, a, a bucket of sand and a cocktail, putting a glow light on the head and a wind blower and a little bit further away. So uh, when it turns out to be a very windy environment, then the wind blower started to blow and you were like, <gasps> Oh no, and the, and, the, uh, and the headphone would be windy as well. Like you would hear like, like in a real beach. So we, uh, we teleported people to the beach uh, using this experience. We did it for, uh, for two weeks and people, everyone that wanted to join was able to, uh, to have a mini holiday uh, in this uh, experience. So exponential technologies. Uh, what are the exponential technologies are you actually aware of? Uh, let me just walk through uh, a few of them that um, that are changing uh, quite uh, rapidly. LoRa, IoT, augmented reality, virtual reality, robotics, uh, inter 
artificial, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning tracking, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, and many more, as you can see. Let me know in a comment if you, uh, if you don't know um, about any of these technologies or if you, if you don't know a specific one, because I can explain what kind of disruption they are actually uh, ha having on, on the world right now. So let me show you my office. Ivo, Ivo? Yes. Uh, You're muted. So this is the office that I work in and uh, I'm actually experimenting with all the technologies every day. And um, nowadays I have most of the technologies at home. So um, like headsets, your headsets right here. AR headsets right here. And um, all of the technologies, they, um, they represent a uh, new reality. So with augmented reality, it means that you can have remote access to the eyes of someone else. So you can actually uh, manage people inside a factory from all over the world and give them instructions. And this can be in real time speech, but also via instructions that you are uh, creating with holograms on their real world. So it's used uh, in a lot of factories, uh, especially those that if they have some maintenance problems and they are standing like 10 minutes, um, they're not working for 10 minutes, it costs them a million dollars. Uh, so they can very quickly uh, remotely uh, have access to a worker without any experience. So uh, you can give them real time education and let them solve the job with your guidance. All of these things, um, I'm just showing a few of them, but um, there are many more like uh, 3D printing. I printed this bat to place a controller in so I can actually uh, keep on playing table tennis. They're all, um, they're all, they're all disrupting a lot. Um, and they're doing that on organizational levels. So organizations that are changing rapidly are, for example, Amazon, who is, uh, who is only showcasing a lot of profits since uh, the coronavirus. So there are ways to do so, and um, we've put them into a recipe list. So the recipe list is over here. There's 11 recipes that organizations that are actually scaling up rapidly right now inside a huge crisis in the world are leveraging. So for example, by hiring staff on demand, you're actually uh, very flexible in, uh, in getting more or less stuff whenever you need that. If you look at Uber, Airbnb, they, own, they don't really own stuff, only people in their office to run the software. And that's like uh, uh, around 100 or 200 people that are running the business. Um, the rest of the people are actually freelancers uh, willing to uh, add on to the staff on demand, uh, work, and if they are not producing, they won't, won't get paid. So there's no risk in it anymore. That's, that's the staff on demand. Just to give you a little example. If you, if you look at community and crowd is how much engagement do you create with the people that follow you uh, with a Coca-Cola or with a Red Bull, they have a huge follower stream, uh, which creates a very valuable brand. And this community and crowd, you can also calculate that. For example, Facebook users, Facebook itself isn't real estate, uh, really isn't worth a thing, but the community on the platform that is using the platform for so many minutes a day, is turned into shares and is turned into values. So if you look at the amount of people that are using Facebook, it's already around two and a half billion. If you calculate it um, by a thousand, you can see how much that company is worth um, in terms of, uh, if you look at the share value of that company. So this thing is new for a lot of banks and uh, you see that a lot of alternative financing and VC and uh, corporate, um, uh, venture capitalists are having to uh, to finance these startups because banks they don't know how to handle things that don't have physical products to uh, to back them up. So you see that uh, that a lot of things are changing in that. Um, let me just um, 
walk you through to the next slides because this is quite some uh, methodology to implement all of these uh, recipes. But um, what happened is that the, the Forbes 500, the, the richest 500 companies in the world, they uh, were replaced, 90% of them were replaced in the last 20 years. And that is all because of the internet. It's all because of digitization, uh, software eating hardware. And it's all because they have leveraged four out of 11 of these recipe uh, elements very well. Some are mostly about uh, the people, experimentation, autonomous teams, uh, being very productive with, uh, without any management. Others about, are about uh, algorithms and automation, about computers replacing human labor. So these two elements, uh, the left brain and the right brain, the creative side and uh, the structured side are the most important elements. If you look at tourism and uh, rethinking that sector, what will we be looking in uh, one and a half meter society when uh, the physical borders are closed? And how can you still have tourism um, uh, while you, you cannot have travelers coming in? Uh, that's like the question you, uh, Algarve is, is uh, having right now, I guess. So if you look at e-commerce, you can see that e-commerce actually went skyrocketing in this time. And if you look at travel, um, you don't really see a lot of companies adapting to this. So you don't really see a lot of tourism uh, uh, um, companies are, that are leveraging, like, for example, VR. But there are some um, that are doing great. And uh, most of these companies are augmented, uh, augmented companies, like uh, uh, this one for, uh, for work. This is spatial, where you can actually travel to anyone in the world as a hologram. You can do it by your PC, but you can also do it by any of your headsets. So this is with a PC, you, uh, you, you're actually like a Zoom inside a room and you can work remotely. Um, and that's the new infrastructure that is like for of the, the touch-free society, as we call it. And it's just looking like digital nomads and how digital nomads are doing their work. Lots of the time already, they are doing it remotely and they are doing it digital first, they're doing it virtually. And now this is going to be uh, extra layered so th that it can be um, uh, touch-free because that's really important right now. So you, if you look at travel, um, how can you transcend travel to a is like the question. If you come up with an answer, there's a huge market potential uh, because there's not a lot of people that are leveraging right now. Uh, some, some apps on, on VR platforms like Wander are implementing all Google Earth images. And you, yeah, if you give it to your grandma, uh, while you cannot really visit your grandma, uh, they can actually have less loneliness by traveling to your home 10 years ago. They will see your home in VR before it was renovated, for example, they can go back like 20 years in time and they can time travel in VR right now. And that's so interesting that uh, every grandma I gave a headset, they were like, whoa, I have to do this every day. So they, uh, they were very happy to do that. If you look at production, uh, if you look at production facilities, you can look at 3D printing as a to localize production more often. So setting up, for example, your own face shield uh, company there are many very small companies in the Netherlands, 3D printing companies uh, that are delivering face shields for hospitals right now. They are using that 3D printers they normally use for gadgets and for fun that are now being used uh, by medical doctors as a face shield. So look at the opportunities and look in the left corner on how you can actually do uh, farming with a 3D printer. If you look at the left corner, it's all done with solar panels you can so you can actually go to the beach while someone is running your farm and a computer is running your farm um yeah mobility is going to be different so mobility if you look at the different forms of mobility there are so many things that people are working on like the concord didn't really make it but the hyperloop for example where perhaps one day um you will be in your own cabine in that travel system and you will be able to travel in two and a half hours from Barcelona to Amsterdam and and that would be yeah working working with other cultures will be so normal when that's a reality and um, in the Netherlands there's a company that wants to finish the first line 
from uh, Amsterdam to Paris in uh, 2028. So it's around eight years from now to finish one, uh, one of these lines. And hopefully the, the whole European Union will be connected so you can travel to Greece within three hours. That, that would be amazing. So uh, traveling all over Europe within just uh, uh, three hours um, without any negative sustainability effects because it's all self-sustainable uh, with solar panels. Um, that would be amazing. So this is one of the things that I do right now to uh, practice and to uh, do my sports. I'm actually uh, using VR to do uh, tennis with uh, friends and table tennis. Uh, you see on the right how I, I changed uh, my, my bed with a 3D printer to a table tennis thing. So look at the, the world and think of the touch-free society and how you can still uh, mimic the real world. So like Apple did uh, back in the days with their uh, um, iPhone, they mimicked, mimicked like how you turn a, a page of a book. And that's all about deception. How can you change the real world into a virtual world that looks com completely the same in motion eh? and that you can click, really clicking, that it feels the same. And here we are actually in our sport uh, accommodation, we are doing VR table tennis. And this is, this is hugely growing. There's uh, a 30% of growth in amount of people are using VR headsets in the last uh, three months in the COVID crisis. So 30%. Now, uh, this was already uh, in, in, in March, the 1.7 million. So it's al already around two and a half million using a headset every month. So that, that could be, uh, get be something that's going to be mainstream in, uh, in uh, not so far ahead future. Um, and we are using that for education, for example, already to, uh, to simulate training. Um, so think about hybrid, hybrid worlds where you can do things still in the physical world and a one and a half meter distance, uh, but maybe it's even nicer and, and in tim more um, immersive to do it in the virtual world when that's, uh, that's needed, like coaching. Uh, like therapy. Uh, these things are much better in VR than in the real world. Um, but it's all about the infrastructure. So having an internet connection is, uh, for this sense, the most important thing in infrastructure. So when people have to work at home, 65% can still manage to do their jobs. And that's, that's, that wasn't possible 10 years ago. That's how fast things are going. And we, we managed to get the Bridge Club. Uh, bridge is a sport. Uh, there's a world championship sport, actually. We managed to get 35,000 elderly online in a month time using a, a bridge app instead of going to a bridge club, like going to, to your golf course. Uh, people uh, emerged so fast in online uh, tools that uh, this is amazing. And this is just done by some instructions, uh, instruction cards. And then grandma is talking to other grandma on the phone. And now they're using Discord, the, the most famous gaming platform for teleconferences. <laughs> they're using Discord with each other. So um, we are actually reshaping a brand. It's called Seats to Meet. They are actually renting out physical meeting spaces. So yeah, they are, they are out of a job right now. There's a huge company with 155 different uh, places they use. And um, what, they, what they haven't done is the online stuff. So they did everything offline. And now we are preparing them with everything in a hybrid form. So online tables, online classrooms, uh, uh, 360 uh, uh, meetings, uh, VR conferences, everything we are transcending uh, for them right now uh, to, to have an extra offering, like from a book to an ebook. It's actually the same thing from a meeting space to an online meeting space. It's actually the same thing. It's quite logical. Um, for example, this marathon we are changing into a, um, a marathon from home. So you cannot go to one uh, city like Rotterdam with two and a half thousand people now. But if you give people a, um, an app like this one and you give them uh, a challenge app where famous Dutch artists are performing, performing music and in between you have challenges on the road while you're running on your own in your own village or city uh, and connect that to your donation platform, uh, people can actually still collect money for this uh, foundation to, uh, to prevent diabetes. Um, now we are preparing for the 3rd of October because we are not certain that we can still offer this event physically. So we have to find a plan B. And we are only using two apps. One is about 
the social media marketing, uh, creating a summary of the whole trip. And the other is about giving people a challenge and a gamification way to, to still finish the, the, the route. Um, so think about other spaces like hotels, restaurants, uh, meeting spaces. Those are quite hard to, to replace with, uh, with online stuff, right? So think about how you can have that connectivity and bring people together um, without having to install software. That's like the first thing, like making it that easy, like web, web based um, to create them an, an alternative. Like I've seen people using Zoom to do live cooking shows. These kind of things, uh, sending, sending food to people's homes and then having live cooking shows where you can practice uh, your cooking with a, uh, a, a chef from a restaurant. These kind of things are amazing and, and people really like to join them. So they are uh, really willing to pay for such services. And the platforms that you can use are, for example, Remo, Hopin, Crowdcast, or for example, VR, where you have an extra dimension of feeling because you can actually uh, uh, create uh, smell and create wind and create warmth and cold in VR worlds while you're actually eating stuff. So we had, um, we had a network meeting with whiskey <laughs> where I was sent whiskey home and then we were in the VR world chatting with each other and drinking the whiskey with each other. That was quite fun. And um, now we, um, I'm part of a network called ExoWorks. And with ExoWorks, we actually want to transform the 5,000 biggest corporates in the world to save the world because their purpose is not really based on CSR, on, on corporate social responsibility. So we want to disrupt them by disrupting their philosophy of the company. And uh, in the back in the days, it was philosophy is making a lot of money and, and making a sustainable business, but that's not a philosophy of a company anymore. You will get disrupted quite fast. So we are actually now helping the Dutch government and some big corporates with at least uh, a million turnaround to transform their business like Unilever we, uh, we helped in uh, translating their philosophy to uh, uh, offering healthy nutrition for a sustainable planet. They changed it into, into that slogan, which means that they are actually cutting out all the unhealthy food out of their assortment. And that's remarkable. That's done in, in a 10 week sprint. And this is, for example, one thing that we did for education. We created an AI to turn research papers into a three minute summary video with just a research paper and a photo of a person. So um, do you want to see the demo? Yeah, you want to see that demo? I can show you. Let me um, stop share this one and I will show you a video of what uh, we, we, we create um, videos automatically with AI within three minutes. So having a paper of 80 pages, turn that into a summary then have a, add a picture to it, choose the language, the spoken language that you wish. We have 80 languages already that you can choose from. So if you want to have your research presented in Chinese, that's possible. And uh, here we go. Morpheus video is a technology uh, that creates videos with natural looking lip. Morpheus video is a ah, the buffering doesn't really work. That's a, <laughs> that's a palmer. videos with natural looking lip movement in any language from almost any content. I will send you uh, I will send you the Dropbox file so you can watch it on your own uh, device. Okay, uh, you need to send it uh, to to see it. Okay, Nick. Yeah. Oh, let me um, let me send it in the link after the presentation and uh, let me continue to finish it up. Um, I have a few more slides if that's okay. Is that okay, America? I'm asking you uh, make it short to finish, Nick, because we need to start debating, or else uh, we don't, we cannot answer the uh, people's questions. Okay, sorry yep. about. But please finish in a very fast way, okay, Nick? Yeah. So the the strategy of of transforming a, a huge corporate is actually three things: is is a, a aiming exponentially higher. We do that with scenario planning at the beginning. So think about 2050 and what kind of legacy you want to have on the world. Then it's all about stakeholders and stakeholder management, uh, trying to get a CEO in and having him um, making, uh, creating the freedom of 10 weeks, 40 hours a week of their top management team to be available to work on new business models and then supercharge your people. And that's actually giving them so much space and time and, and a professional coach. Uh, like we, we bring in like five coaches and a lot of 
to um, to give uh, managers a possibility uh, to actually uh, to actually turn their management or top management into um, in a super team. And these are things that we use for that. So if you uh, if you're willing to read a book, uh, these two on the right are very recommended: exponential organization and exponential transformation. And that's actually the uh, the trend of become uh, turning a linear trend into an exponential trend, and then doing that with your business. And the recipes on the on the left are now into like a business model canvas on the left corner, uh, so that people can actually uh, start experimenting with this. And in the end, it's all about um, measuring how adaptable you are to change. So if you are very good at all of these uh, recipes, uh, you can test yourself. Uh, definitely check out this uh, Bitly uh, extra trend because it's a report about how fast technology is disrupting uh, industries. But also to do a test. If you have an organization in mind, do a test and see how, how um, well they are prepared for uh, a very fastly changing society. And then uh, you can find your score and you can see if you're uh, in between 55 and 100, uh, then that means that you are probably going to survive for the next 10 years. If it's uh, underneath that amount, uh, you probably uh, won't be uh, alive anymore. You will be bankrupt because of the uh, other companies and startups that are going to disrupt you. So that was my presentation. And this is me in VR. Uh, and this is my avatar. And um, we are... Um, coaching students to become an entrepreneur with the side project. And we uh, have set up a, a series, a podcast series, uh, on a startup impact series on uh, social entrepreneurship to, uh, to give people uh, uh, good information and tips about how to set up a social enterprise. Um, so that's, uh, that's it. If there's a questions uh, or you want to connect, uh, definitely do that um, and use the comments uh, and uh, I will be happy to answer them for you. So thank you very much, Nick. I'm sorry that I, I asked you to, to speed up, but uh, we need to go to, to, to the debate. Thank you. Very interesting, um, very challenging. Uh, uh, as I asked you, you're very techy. <laughs> so <laughs> there's lots of technologies in, 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 the, in the question here. So I think um, we, did, uh, we have already these uh, three uh, visions. Um, they they complement. Uh, some more about the basics, the mindsets, uh, something more about how can education uh, support a nurse and empowering uh, students and also give them the responsibility um, to, to become uh, 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 entrepreneurs since very early and a vision on uh, how disruptive technology also can be used as a, a, a way of operating or taking the opportunities of uh, what's happening in, a, in, a, in, a, in this uh, post-COVID uh, pandemic uh, um, economy and, and, and crisis. So for, for the first, thank you very much for, for, for all of your contributions. Now we have uh, uh, some questions here. Um, uh, I think uh, we can put to Tom, there is a question here uh, from Edgar, from Edgar Leandro. It's asking you, how could COVID affect entrepreneur? Um, uh, entrepreneurs, I'm sorry. Um, um, can you elaborate on that also? And Tom, also, if you want to also make some comments on other visions, on complementing of the other vision of the guests, of course, more than welcome. Um, I think for now, this is the, the, the question that is towards, towards Tom. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you both on uh, Nick and Simon for uh, being out here. It's really inspiring to just listen to you guys. Um, and I think indeed, uh, thank you, America, for uh, bringing us all together, being quite complimentary on uh, on on our uh, insights. Um, I, I, regarding the question, Edgar, I, I think uh, I come close to Nick's vision, meaning that being that if you're an entrepreneur uh, in COVID nineteen, you you are either uh, going to go digital, or you're going to go uh, really human. I think the the um, the in between space um, will be gone, and that, that's some sort of prediction, I think. But if I just look around in Belgium and I look around in the, in my networks, um, being also an exponential transformation, um, I'm, I'm noticing that uh, entrepreneurs um, <clears throat> either go for the full experience, being the human experience, or either go for the full digital experience. 
the the, the in between. I I think that the um, there will be no room for the in between. The COVID nineteen will be, will either uh, lure your your customers into the the real um, the real deal or the full digital deal, and I think that that's that's where today we see we see entrepreneurs going. Um, what I see in Belgium, I cannot say that's happening in 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 the world, but what I see in Belgium is that um, startups they're surviving because they are mainly focusing on digital and they are surviving. Um, existing small medium enterprises are really are, and traditional enterprises are really getting getting a hard time. For them, it's really hard to switch to digital. They try to hop on, but many come too late, um, and they don't have the, the, the trust of the customer yet. While we all trust those big platforms, you know, they, they are, they're like magnets. Um, Google, Amazon, Netflix, Facebook, they raise the bar so high that if you're just a small enterprise and, and you're entering the digital market, that, uh, that's really hard getting there. So you need to do fall back and hopefully that, that your customer will, will can show up at your doorstep, at your door. But I'm, I'm not sure. So Edgar, I hope that that's an answer to your question. But from my perspective, um, it's going to be either be full on real life experience. So meaning you go to the Algarve and you go there and you waste time, Simon. I agree with you. Um, I, meet, I ask my people in the next meeting, wait a couple of moments because I'm in the Algarve for now, but I'll be back in 15 minutes. Um, so that's perfectly possible in this situation. Um, versus doing it completely digital. And, and Nick, um, I had experience from Utrecht, not in Utrecht, but in Austin a few years ago. Um, they made me um, go to the beach in Malibu at that time, having the same experience that I was really in Malibu until somebody woke me up again. So yeah, that, that's I think where we're going. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, uh, Simon, uh, also you have a, a, a nice question here from our colleague uh, Susanna, and it's uh, it's uh, it's something that is very difficult for all of us as designers, as uh, people connected uh, to the, to the creative er 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 areas. That is, when do we see it's a failure? Okay, do we have? bankrupt a company to see it's a failure. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, stressing out or uh, making an effort, effort on this. But I think it's a, a quite a nice question. So you defend and very well in my point of view, failure is a, it's part of the process, it should be intended. Um, how can we say, okay, this is where we need to change. The, the failure is here. Can you help in that? What is your... Americo, yes. I think the, the, the second part of her question is quite well explain uh, how to distinguish a necessary change of strategy for a total failure of the idea. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so you either failing or you need to change your strategy. Uh, that's the, the, the best part of the question. I'm sorry to yeah, emphasize it. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I'm going to put a counterintuitive issue here is the, um, um, a number measurable is that what's really interesting about innovation creativity is that um, things that are unmeasurable and have no boundaries are very difficult to understand whether it has grown stopped growing or has started so what, what we encourage people and how we drive success is that um, and it's quite funny as, as a, being trained as a designer is that numbers now are really important to me so how do you recognize something? If you anticipated there was four people who wanted it and there's only two, it's 50% failure. So was it the issue then? So you have something to measure it by saying, okay, was it the fact it was a, good, a bad idea or the wrong time? So it's, a, it's an ability then to create an understanding of how you're gonna, you're gonna measure and how you're gonna perceive the context you're in. And that is another part of the entrepreneurial um, mindset is that, and it might not be, you know, many of them, they don't have millions of spreadsheets, but they have a mechanism 
that they can contextualize what that value is perceived to be and whether they're on the right route to achieving it. And, and the first part of the question, so that's the second part, the, the numbers and measures and metrics are so important to um, entrepreneurship and innovation. But the, the first part is you have two, two issues to it. Firstly, you have to recognize things aren't working. And that comes down to numbers and, um, oh, well, some form of metric, but also engaging with people. And I think that you, what we're looking for is lots of little failures rather than big failure. So if you're um, understanding, well, you know, there's the, was it the, was it the technology or was it the interface? You might have a great algorithm, but people can't interact with it. Or you might have a really beautiful interface, but it doesn't do anything. So it's about getting these ideas out and test and seeing which bits break down. And so the first part is ask lots of questions and try and have some form of way you're going to perceive how you're going to um, place your idea within a metric. So you can say, well, this was great. And if you're going to f get future funding, all these horrible venture capitalists looking for demand and value. So unfortunately, whether you like my comment or not, it's going to come down to the numbers, guys. And, and Simon, I think it's perfectly clear the, the, the answer. Uh, if I may add, uh, so these reinforce also something that you, you brought to us, but these reinforce there's that for innovation and for entrepreneurship, there's a process. And, uh, and, and the focus should be on the process because if the process needs to be very well designed in the sense also of the measurement of the, of the control of the process itself. So if you have different uh, milestones, different places where you, you make a cross check on, on, on where you're going, on your pathway, then you can start looking, yes, this is going well, this is failing, this is to uh, make a change, this is to improve, or this is okay, let's go to the, to the, to the next stage. I, th I think uh, for our um, audience in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurs uh, or uh, entrepreneurs proposant, um, I think it's very important to understand that this is not, as you said, so just reinforcing, this is not only about the idea, <laughs> it's about the insights, it's about the checking of the demands, it's about the checking of the solutions. And so it's a hard work process. Uh, and sometimes um, in, this, uh, in this mythical world of entrepreneurship, there's message that it's, it's just having an idea, it's, 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 it's fun. Is post-it, you know. It's there's some. This message still goes on, still goes on to the to the young entrepreneurs. And what entrepreneurship and innovation nowadays is is a very hard work. Um, of course, is a joy ride. You, you can have fun on the, on the process on the ride, but is 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 quite a hard work where you need to be very very careful with all the stages and the, all the milestones so that you can have a control of what you're developing. Oh, one I mean, thing I would add to, sorry, sorry. just to, to go ahead. Frank. Yeah, you also have this paradigm shift. Is that yes, I, I talk. I prefer to talk about frameworks rather than models, because you've got to avoid the process. People hanging on to the process. I think Nick described it quite well. Is that I, I, I encourage frameworks, and also you've got to design. You've got to build and break things. Otherwise, if you get too hang, hung up on the process, is that you're driving the process, not the learning. But if you have no process, there's no endpoints. So it's all I would say is it's a balance between having a, a clearly defined journey, but encouraging some different routes and build and break things in that process. So it's just, I just wanted to stress that, yes, I said numbers, but it's not it's not prescriptive you need frameworks that give you a, a, so you don't get lost but don't get hung up about i haven't done 3.4 hours today you know it, it, it build break and rebuild uh, i was i was going to say that uh, I, I was going through my notes uh, about tom's presentation 
uh, I think this issue is also about the, the, the networking or exposing your ideas to, to others. Uh, because uh, a, a way of, of checking failure or avoiding failure is to, uh, to through exposing your ideas, to validating your ideas, uh, sharing it with others. Uh, and, and don't be afraid of sharing your, your ideas. I was talking earlier today with on one of our students uh, was asking about bringing one of his ideas to, to a classroom exercise that we are starting uh, today. And I was telling him, uh, you, you need to share this idea with, with your colleagues. And you need to feel uh, comfortable about sharing it. Um, and to remember that uh, the, the ideas are based on on some on information that is available to everyone. So if it was uh, like this in the invention of the light bulb or photography or telephone of of the airplane, uh, that several different people around the world invented those things uh, altogether, out of just one or or two came to be known as the the two. We, we know how the process. Uh, happens uh, if this with, with these big inventions if it was like this why should it be different with your your idea so share uh, networking is is a very significant process to to sharing and to validate your ideas thank you, thank you. thanks you also Gabriel very clear uh, also taking your, the point that we are discussing now, I see that Nick is also uh, sharing uh, in our uh, chat. That is an interesting, uh, interesting point. Also, it connects to what Tom says, and also with uh, with Simon. That is um, the, the 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 how how to make the networking uh, after this. And I think um, just to 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 ignite your comment, uh, Nick is uh, if, if, if uh, the networking until now was uh, creating uh, connections between uh, startup centers and um, sharing some uh, pitches uh, for the same investor capitalist, I think we, we should, and that's what you said now, is I think we should to, to start networking in all the stages of the, of the process. So I think if we are in, in the Algarve and if there's, some expert like Nick on technology and the advantage of technology. Since the beginning that our NQBs uh, start thinking about technology, uh, we should make them uh, near you or near an expert. That's what you are saying, yes, Nick? Yeah, so especially if you, um, uh, when I was coaching in Thailand, when I was coaching a business school in Thailand, what I recognize is that um, if you look at the system that they are working in and their education system, then you see that they are walking like 10 to 15 years behind in the system that we have in the Netherlands. So you have a lot of pre-knowledge already when entering such country uh, on how to create a system that is very good in creating a very efficient uh, and a productive uh, way of doing things. But it doesn't always mean that it fits so um, we uh, normally use design thinking to get to know the context as good as possible, uh, the problems behind the problem, and then start looking at the best practices that you can find all over the world and getting to know the experts that have actually implemented these problems uh, and solutions in that region. For example, Boyan Swat using the ocean cleanup for cleaning the ocean. While in Thailand and Singapore, they have a lot of plastic soup in their rivers. They should be connected because there is a person that is solving something that is actually uh, in the context of someone else's problem. It's not in the Netherlands that there's so much plastic in the ocean. That's not in Europe. It's in Asia. So um, definitely uh, try to connect with those that have already done it before uh, or uh, connect with people that have the knowledge about a system and a system that is, uh, is, is, is less wasteful, eh? is a little bit better. So uh, try, to, to, try to aim high, try to connect with, uh, for example, Peter Diamandis or uh, the G uh, CEO of Google. And if you cannot get to that point, yeah, try to find their, uh, like the second managers. Uh, try to connect a little bit lower. So you get the best coaches around you from the start. 
Uh, and it's not scary to just LinkedIn invite a person and then uh, do a good introduction with a small note, like, well, I'm really fan of you and your work and I, I really have a good question for you. I hope you can answer it. And then you see they will add you and uh, you have a super network in no time. Thank you, Nick. Americo, you, 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 you muted your, your sound. Okay, it's, it's my, my new Mac. This, this, uh, this touch, touch pad is not good for me. <laughs> I have a very old Mac, 2015 one. It works still the best. <laughs> So I was just saying there is also a question here for, from Bruno for, for his map, that is how can uh, established entrepreneur, entrepreneur enterprises help and collaborate with the, our IC project. Um, uh, 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 in, our, in, our, in our project, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, we need, we need uh, establishing enterprises in our ecosystem, like Tom said. So we, uh, we, we are uh, creating the ice, ice ship, uh, let's say from, from, from the beginning, from zero, but looking at all the best practice. And one of the things uh, the, that, that we put on the project is this connection with the, the entrepreneurs uh, that already have, are in the Algarve, not only as mentors, because I don't think it's, uh, it's not enough that sometimes uh, these uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneur, uh, uh, business people come and talk to our startups uh, companies, uh, we want a little bit deeper than that. We want some kind of relationship where, if needed, um, these uh, established uh, companies can uh, adapt and can, for instance, uh, inside their companies, uh, give some experience of one week, two weeks to these entrepreneurs. Um, I, 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 in Lisbon, I was, uh, I was mentoring some students of the previous university and one of the most successful uh, um, young guys that made an international successful business with uh, towels for beach, it was one, one person, one, one young man that was uh, supported uh, uh, by a sugar company CEO but it's not what the guy didn't went to the, 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 the university and talk to him. He said, you come and work with me or aside me two weeks. You come, you work in your project, I'm working in my company and we will talk and we will learn with each other. And uh, Frederic, uh, Frederic learned a lot. So it was two weeks that were worth a lot of money for Frederic. And uh, the businessman came uh, to become an uh, investor in this, uh, in this tower business. So this is what we end a deeper relation, uh, more than just a mentor or just somebody, a facilitator that comes for one seminar or not. So we are building that with the investors, business angel investors in the Algarve that will be uh, uh, pre present in our session tomorrow. But we are now starting the process of talking to more business people, men and women of the Algarve, and not only that can have, accept this philosophy of um, more deepened and more uh, human-based uh, support. And, and because it's a, it's everybody learns. The business entrepreneur uh, learns with a startup entrepreneur and vice versa. So uh, um, we are starting now the process of talking to, to, to other business people than we already have done uh, in order to see, to have a, like a, a time bank, but a bank with CEOs, with experienced people that really want to get deep on this relation with the young entrepreneurs. But thank you for the question, Bruno. I hope I can, I, I did uh, my best to, to make it clear. Uh, it, it's part of our target to develop this ecosystem. We need everybody because without all the pieces together, it's not an ecosystem. <laughs> and uh, it, this, is, this needs to be an ecosystem like Tom, Tom said, uh, and, and Simon also brought to us and, and, and Nick, and nowadays even more, okay? So um, that's what I wanted to answer to, to, to Bruno. And uh, I was thinking, I was looking at, uh, if there, we have more questions. Uh, so um, I don't know, uh, a round of uh, final remarks uh, from our uh, guests. Uh, Simon, do you want to make a final 
uh, a final comment, a final, give us a final tip, even more, more useful than you already done, that's difficult, but just final words. And again, for our side, thank you very much for being with us. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Be resilient. That's a strong one. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nick. Thanks. Cheers. Forward mindset. Sorry, Nick. I, I, we, we, cannot, we could not listen. Okay. Uh, forward uh, moving mindset. So uh, mindset rules, that's the most important thing. Okay, okay, okay. 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 So that's, that's reinforcing messages. Gabriel, final comments for us. I'll get a phrase from a, a webinar that I watched yesterday. Uh, as you can't predict your future, uh, design your future. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's a good one. So uh, that's the, the time where I shut up. <laughs> Everything is said. So. Thank you everybody for being present in our webinar. It was really a, a, a pleasure. Uh, how I hope it was as good as uh, it was for me. So uh, uh, my mind is, uh, is thinking about several things from this the debate and this discussion. That's the aim of our webinars uh, at Takeoff Algarve. So I hope the, the participants also have something to, to think about it. Uh, so thank you very much. We close the session for for today. Tomorrow we have another webinar uh, uh, focus on branding, communication, uh, how can we do and help uh, reposition the Algarve brand uh, and much more to come. So thank you very much uh, to everybody. I'm closing the session. Thank you, Gabrielle. Thank you, Susanna, for supporting everything to put this together. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Nick and Tom. Thank you Bye. all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.